Welcome, everyone. It's Film Threat on a Friday. I am Chris Gore. We have a lot to talk about on the show today. First up, I know we were a little late today. It's because I was finishing up the first two episodes of Ahsoka. I will give you my social media reaction, very brief reaction to the first two episodes. In addition, Blue Beetle is here. Will it save the DC Universe? We shall see. Plus, Strays is a movie that's coming out. It's a raunchy R-rated comedy with dogs. All oh, and uh, some other independent films to discuss, including The Adults and Landscape with Invisible Hand. One of these movies is amazing. One of the films we're going to be talking about today is incredible. In fact, one of my favorite films of the year. Which one will it be? So much to discuss. Your comments and questions. Plus, Alan Ng is waiting in the wings. Let's get things started. It's Film Threat on a Friday. Let's go. Let's go, folks. Let's let's get things going. I see your comments. I see you in the comments. <laughs> Oh, oh, God, typical. Uh, bachelor number three again. You have just invited me over for dinner. What's on your menu? Oh, how about some exotic foods? Uh, some lobster that I caught earlier this morning, some abalone that I've been pounding on all day. Oh! <laughs> bachelor number one. Same question. A boo. At least one. You sound pretty safe. Okay. <laughs> Alan, do you love refrigerator? I love refrigerator. <laughs> I've never loved a man more than I love Alan right now. You and a hundred other men. <laughs> oh uh, my God, dude. Uh, good yeah. to see you. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> I don't know what that was. <laughs> I, I love it. So like, these uh first of all shout out to leo cody and glenn brown our producer who put together all these little videos at the top i like i love to surprise alan and just show him these videos before we start and no one yeah. no one the weird thing is i was there when i said it it was <laughs> right right you're not i mean your words aren't being manipulated that much <laughs> although wait have you have you seen have you seen this one oh, i love comic books I love my Barbie. Alan, do you love refrigerator? I love refrigerator. <laughs> my God. All right. Okay. <laughs> I someone is going to hell for all these videos. I hope I it's not. I hope it's not me. Um, we have seen Blue Beetle. I've seen the first two episodes of Ahsoka, and I've a bunch of independent films to talk about today. Uh, but let's get to your comments and questions. Before we get things started, let's go. Southeastern Kaiju has become a YouTube member. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Some, some big announcements coming this week for members only. Hail all. Gary is 60 today, says Scott Christie Jones. Is that true? He's 50. but uh, I, I will check in with Gary and I will yeah. confirm. I'm pretty sure he's not older than us. But ha happy birthday to Gary Beekler at Nerd Roddick. Uh, Miss Master Deimos, it was a good movie. You should all see it. I don't know which movie. Maybe. We're Maybe. We'll, we'll see. We don't know uh, which movie you're talking about either. Auto Auto Automa Tom says, well, there you go. Oh, wait. Big Super Chat just came in. Hey. Big Super Chat. From Yorozuya for one hundred dollars. Wow. Alan, what's your response? Oh, I thought you were gonna play something. Sixty-nine. Well, there you go. Uh, thank you, Yorozuya. That's incredibly generous. That's awesome. He says, "Ciao." I don't normally super chat anyone, but I just had to say I love the streams and appreciate everything you do. Finally being able to see Old Boy in theaters was a great experience. I could talk about that film for hours. Hearing the crowd gasp was the best part. Well, we will talk about it later today. Do we have that all ready to go, Alan? No, we the don't. Banners? 
Let's get that. Let's get. Let's get you that. You know in why there. it wasn't on because the list? I forgot. It's on the list now because we bumped it from Wednesday. But I do have a very quick announcement. Thank you, Yorazuya. Yes. Thank, thank you, you for that. That's amazing. That is uh, very generous. God, appreciate that. Uh, next week, Hollywood on the Rocks is normally on Wednesdays. Hollywood on the Rocks will be on Tuesday at 9 a.m. I will remind people in the community tab. We're going to put the live link up early. Why are we doing that? Because we will be reviewing the first two episodes of Ahsoka on Tuesday at 9 a.m., one day before it premieres. Okay? So Hollywood on the Rocks, we're moving from Wednesday to Tuesday. Just a reminder. So uh, just letting you know in advance to plan accordingly. So it'll be an earlier, a, a, a new day earlier time specifically for that. And then we won't be doing Hollywood on the rocks on Wednesday. We're just moving it up a day. So there you go. Uh, Hey, Beerosaurus Rex has been a member for 12 months, one year. Cheers everyone on this Friday. Thank you. Copperhead. Cheers, che what, wait, what'd you say, Alan? I said, cheers, Beerosaurus Rex. Yeah. Beerosaurus Rex. Always love that name. Copperhead 72 for four just sends in a super sticker. Thank you for that. And your other comments here. Good morning, film threat people. Scan in, says Imperfect. <laughs> and how many minutes will Alan, late will Alan be? He's not, he's sort of, Alan's never late. Alan it just shows up when Alan shows up, which I love. Uh, Imperfect goes on to say, pre-coffee Chris is my favorite Chris. So gravelly and sultry. Well, I'll say this. I am on my second coffee cup today because I got up early to watch the first two episodes of Ahsoka. And I, I grabbed this mug, which says somebody wrote that. And it's a WGA mug. Oh. I don't remember how I got this. In solidarity. Gosh. Well, in, in a place to put my coffee. But yes, in solidarity to uh, the WGA strikers. Thank you, Imperfect. Appreciate that. You remember. Jocelyn says, my two favorite critics, movie critics, Hail FT. Oh, thanks. And hey, Yoro Zuya has become a YouTube member. Then join us on Discord. Go to the community tab. Only for members only. You'll see on the community tab on YouTube. Uh, you can join the Discord and you can talk to us anytime. You can talk to all the members on our Discord. You can check out all the memes that people post of Alan because no one ever posts. Well, people do post memes of me, but you have a very memeable face. Alan, you're just very memeable. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I know. I'm surprised there weren't many uh crunchy bush memes coming out or uh yeah, there weren't videos. very many of those. So the nerd far away says Chris will arrive precisely when he means to. And Leo Cody, hey, thank you, Leo. Guten Tag, film thread family, says Leo. And Bill S. Preston Esquire says, make mine Irish. I may be hung over from open bar. Open bar was great yesterday. Uh, critical drinkers stream. Very good stream as always. Lots of fun. Lots of Rachel Zegler stuff, which is crazy. Um, we've never, we haven't really talked about that. Uh, yeah. I, I think we just let everyone else talk about it. We, yeah. <laughs> like let's let everyone else play the exact same clips and get their comments. And first of all, I don't mind. I'm here for it. Like, uh, I think it's crazy, but wow. Jericho Leon says Alan yeah. makes everything better. There I swear you my entire YouTube recommend feed is Rachel Zegler for some reason. Is it? Yeah. It feels that way. It's like I just you just can't escape her at the moment. And yeah. Well, okay, what do you have to say about Alan? You are the biggest Disney fan ever. What are your comments on the Rachel Zegler, Snow White, and the seven Portland baristas? What do you, what do you think? Yes. Uh, I talked about this on WWD pro yesterday, but the biggest thing is um, what is up with this disrespect for Walt Disney? Uh, you know, the, the it's Disney 100 and where's Walt Disney to be found. Uh, he's, he's been pushed to the side, canceled, whatever. Um, but so what bothers me is not only is it so disrespectful to Disney, Walt Disney, the man, but why is the Walt Disney company not coming to the defense of their founder? 
Uh, so that's what I think. This is this is the most frustrating thing about it, and the most. Uh, it, it's like, look, Snow White could be the greatest movie ever, and it's been tainted by just just the talk of a uh, Ms. Ziegler. Yeah, I, uh, I. Here's the thing, I've been I've interviewed many well-known people and celebrities for years. Uh, I don't want to date myself, but. Uh, Going back to the 90s, even earlier, I've interviewed a lot of people. I find actors to be the least interesting part of the process. They just are, to me, the least interesting part. I prefer to talk to writers and directors. Producers can be interesting. For the most part, they're politicians. They're about fundraising, putting together the project. But uh, di the directors and writers that are true craftspeople, that are artists, they're interesting to talk to. Actors are the least interesting to talk to, and only a small percentage of actors have anything interesting to say. Those are the ones that actually understand the craft of filmmaking and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Actors mainly parrot things they've heard, or they'll say things they think they should say because it will continue to get them work. But I've, I've always found actors to be kind of vapid, and they're whatever their opinion is based on, it's rooted in, will this continue to help me get work in Hollywood? Mm -hmm. So when I see an actor say something stupid, I say, well, that's a Tuesday in Hollywood. So it's not all that interesting. So I, I'm, su I'm surprised. First of all, I'm not surprised that Rachel Zegler said all those things. What is shocking to me is one, that she wasn't stopped by people who were mm -hmm. managing her behind the scenes. I mean, you're working for the Disney company and the, the movie that literally led to you having a job in the present day right. from 1937 that you should have such disrespect and a complete profound lack of interest or even knowledge of the history and how significant Snow White was at the time. I mean, they called it Disney's folly. They thought he was crazy. And he got loans from banks, literally. And by the way, uh, Walt Disney, if you if you research this, he has filed for bankruptcy seven times across his career. I mean, it, it's it's in it's mm -hmm. remarkable how much of an impact that he had and how many risks he took in making the films that he did. There's a reason that they have survived as long as they have. And I, I, my prediction is this movie, I, I don't think anybody has any positive thoughts about this film. It looks like it's going to be terrible. Mm -hmm. But an actor saying something stupid is so, it's just, I, I feel like I'm so numb to it because they, they, and the other thing is that actors for the most part are pleasers. So they're looking to please the person that's in front of them in this very moment, whether it's a director they're auditioning for, whether it's a casting agent that they're having a conversation with. Their whole thing is to be liked because how you get hired in Hollywood is not always related to talent. And it is. But more importantly, are you likable? Can you can you be on a set for 18 hours and keep up that energy and, and um and and they're looking to please. So when I see these actors making stupid comments to the media, it's because that's what the media asked them to say. And they're just trying to please the media person or the media outlet that's in front of them at, front of them at that very moment. Alan, any other thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I'll just go back again. I, you know, she said what she said, and I still can't believe the the Walt Disney Company in its 100 year celebration has yet to really put anything out about Walt Disney. Uh, they are not defending him. They're not talking about him. Uh, it's as if he never existed and that uh, all his efforts to bring a company 100 years uh, to, to celebrate its 100-year anniversary, why have they, you know, why will they refuse to acknowledge the existence of this man and the founder? And I, I just don't understand it. Because I, I think if they did, if they really went through and did some retrospective, some documentary about Walt Disney, maybe that would turn the company around. Right. Just maybe. Well, well, here we go. Real quick comment from Jonathan Carter Scholl. says, do you realize how many actors are in your audience? Do you realize you're insulting me and your audience? 
Well, um, correct me if I'm wrong. You're, you've been around a lot of actors. Am I not wrong that they're looking to please whoever is in front of them? Uh, am I not wrong that they often parrot opinions they've heard? And, I, I, you know, I, I'm sorry if you take it as an insult. This is my experience in more than three decades in this industry covering it. I find that the most interesting part of the process are writers and directors. And I'll just say that uh, you can take it as an insult, but you might want to look around you and, and consider that that might be, that may be true. There's a ring of truth in it. I will also say this, that isn't true for every actor. I didn't say a hundred percent of actors. There are actors I've met that understand the craft. And these are usually actors like, for example, a Tom Cruise. He understands the audience. He's not looking to insult the audience. And Tom Cruise is a producer. He's keeping the audience in mind more than any other thing. And I, I think if you look at the Rachel Zegler situation, it's really difficult to be sympathetic towards her or to any actors that seek to vilify the audience or vilify 50% of Americans. I, I just, I prefer to see actors focus on, and there are many actors I respect quite a bit, um, Tom Cruise being among them, Denzel Washington. When you see the way in which they conduct themselves publicly, it's very admirable. And those are actors to be revered. So Jonathan, um, you can take it as an insult, but I'm passing along information and I'll just say that it, it is... Uh, it is the truth as I have seen it in covering this industry. So Jonathan, if you are, in a, and that's a, a great photo, by the way, if that's your headshot, if that's your headshot, uh, that's pretty amazing. But thank you for your comment. I do appreciate that. Uh, some quick super chats here that we're going to jump right in to our main topic today. Uh, let's see. Something's weird. It's not allowing me to select. Because you hate actors. That's why. No, I don't hate actors. You I hate just, actors. I, there are th parts of the process that are interesting to me. And I find there is a, uh, among actors, that's just, that's just a thing. Yeah. You I mean, know, we've had I, discussions about interviewing actors and it, it's not that it wouldn't be interesting. It's just, you know, we're about the filmmaking process. I'm interested and, in truth. I'm interested yeah. in truth. I'm interested in truth. And I like when someone is vulnerable and tells me the truth. Mm -hmm. And I feel like actors are not only performing when they're on screen, they're performing when they're doing interviews. That's a fact. And they're, you know, not often as it doesn't happen as often as it should, but I'd like to hear an actor be real about this industry and to tell the truth about this industry, about the struggles in this industry and about what you have to do to be an actor, a working actor that gets hired often. What, what goes into that? Mm -hmm. How, what do you, what, what really, how do you really get cast in something? Talent is part of it, but it ain't the whole thing. Yes. And the business. Yeah. So, so uh, I'm interested in truth and I, I would like to hear the truth. I'm going to start from the bottom here on these comments. Uh, MM for five says, I get the actors as pleasers thing, but does Hollywood not get the people they ultimately have to please as the audience? How do they miss that? Yes. The only audience you should care about pleasing mostly is, is the audience. Is the audience. <laughs> Ken Vogel. I don't care what race Snow White is, honestly. And I'll say, I think Rachel Zegler, she looks like Snow White. I don't mm -hmm. care. She looks like she looks like a very pretty Disney princess. Uh, I, no one's really debating that. He goes on to say, Zegler should learn to only speak positively about what she is working on. Her PR team should fire her. Well, I would love for her to watch a documentary about the making of Snow White and about Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. And who he is. Hello, are you still stuck in a mental hospital? Says Slayer 96, DA second for two. No, I am not. Um, from Rumble, A Dallas 24, the disrespect for the granddaddy of all animated films. Mm -hmm. Chris, where did you get that American flag jacket that you wore to anime Matsuri? Says Sean Belknap. I got that at TJ Maxx. Zavin says, member for five months, Blue Beetle, no Ted Cord. No relationship with Booster Cold Gold. No interest in watching. Well, wait a second. Yeah, you'd be wrong on one point. <laughs> yeah, you'd need to see the movie. You need to see the movie. And I do, I appreciate Jonathan's comment. 
if he's being honest and truthful. I appreciate his comment because I like opposing points of view. I like to discuss it. But you have to admit that of late, especially in the last several years, especially since 2016, actors have made many actors, and there's countless examples of actors that have made no bones about uh, hating on their audience. And uh, that's not a winning strategy long term for Hollywood. Yeah. Look, we're, we're up for respectful criticism. Respectful yeah, criticism yeah. I'm all about. But um, don't take it personal. That's all I'll say. I would not take it personal. You're one of the good actors. Let's just say that. You're one of the good actors. and They're out there. They I are. Know. When I have had a normal conversation with an actor, when they can actually be honest where they're not on, I've had some very interesting conversations. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. But let's get right into it because I know why you're here, folks. Let's talk about Blue Beetle. Let's get into it. Blue Beetle is here. This is a film from the DC Cinematic Universe. And I still have no idea how this film fits into the future of DC or how it wraps into its past. But Alan, tell us the story of Blue Beetle. <laughs> Story of Blue Beetle. So a uh, long time ago, there was a scarab, I guess, from outer space that landed. And uh, the Cord Corporation has had possession of it. Uh, I guess they lost it. I Don't ask me about the lore of this. Uh, they found it. Uh, but uh, and it was uh, under mysterious circumstances. Uh, who is this? Uh, Victoria Cord, played by Susan Sarandon. She is running the company. Uh, her her brother once ran it and uh, died mysteriously, and so uh, she's at odds with her niece, who is uh, Jenny Court. And um, sorry, I just saw last night, so I'm getting names. Oh, good, it's all good. Man. Um, and so, uh, so in an effort to not weaponize, kind of like Tony Stark, not weaponize Cord Industries, uh, Jenny steals the scarab, passes it on to a. a you know, an acquaintance she made the day before in uh, in Jaime Reyes. He takes it off. the The scarab chooses him, and he becomes the Blue Beetle. And now uh, there's a race to for the cord uh, cord industries to get that scarab back. But the thing is, the scarab has infused himself itself with Jaime, and they have to kill him in order to get it back. And there you go. That's that's your movie. And what did what did I think of it? Um, it's the saddest thing about this movie is it's bookended. It's in a field of very bad, mediocre superhero films. And so I feel like this movie, we would probably think it was a lot better had the movies surrounding it been better. Um, to me, this movie is bland, but good. Uh, and I will tell you the main reason why it's bland. Uh, there's this idea called the hero's journey where, uh, where a hero has to, has, you know he's 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 got to overcome an insur insurmountable odds, but he has a fatal flaw, and by overcoming that fatal flaw, he becomes a better person. Uh, he becomes uh, how did I put it here? Uh, yeah, he becomes, you know, he he becomes a better person uh, and learns something about himself. Uh, in a way, it's how we relate to these characters. But in this character, he's Jaime Reyes is essentially he's a good kid from a good family. This good family defeats evil, and and that's essentially the theme of the story. And and to me, that's you know, it, it's good for a Disney Channel movie. Uh, it's not good for a in a cinematic movie. And I also say this: um, the movie, this movie, should appeal to young kids, to to the younger set. But because of the violence is okay, but because of all the dick jokes and the swearing. Um, you kind of you, you're now excluding families with small kids to see this movie, and I think this movie had you removed a lot of the dick jokes and stuff, um, it would have you know you you, you brought in your audience by by allowing kids to see this movie. It's it's okay. It, it's it's a nice nicely done movie. I think the budget uh, was perfect for it, and and like I said, had you just removed the dick jokes and the swearing, I, I think you would have a profitable movie on your hands. Right. So that, that's my thoughts about this. All right. Well, thank you for going over the story, Alan. I'm going to start with the good 
because there are some good aspects to this film. Although I 100% agree, this is good, but bland. Uh, here's the good parts. Uh, Sholo Maradueña uh, is very good. Mm -hmm. I loved him in Cobra Kai. Uh, he's the highlight of Cobra Kai and he is incredibly likable and relatable. You know, home run A plus on the casting. And you're going to see, regardless of what happens with Blue Beetle, the character or the whatnot in, in future DC, uh, Sholo has got a, a, a bright career in front of him. Quite enjoyed him. The other thing I enjoyed, the family dynamic. And I'm going to uh, speak very positively about this. The family dynamic, and you see this in films uh, with um, any film with Latino cultures, very, very much family-based. Mother, father, siblings, uncles. They're, they're very, very, uh, I mean, that part, those parts got me. I thought that really worked, the family dynamic. It's not just the origin of Blue Beetle. It's this family that that is uh, at odds with the antagonist, played by Susan Sarandon. So I really, really love the family dynamic. It also made me think, I mean, you see, and, and you've seen it often in, in Latino cinema, st strong family dynamic and an intact family. We rarely will ever see an intact white family, an intact black family. Uh, you know, they didn't they didn't uh, race swap like the dad is this or whatever. And I kind of find like I, I was like, I loved it. I love the family. It's like, why can't that happen with other types of families? Why can't you have that kind of dynamic? You know, it's like it's like the only intact family that you actually see, you know, uh, in movies are Latino families. I think that says a lot about um, how much that is such a value. I don't know that this movie would would do as well or be as likable without that. So the family was great, including uh, the sister uh, Mila Reyes. I, I thought she, I thought she was very funny. Good comic relief. Uh, those are the things that I liked the best about the film. Let me add one more to that. Uh, Please. We've talked about this romance. Yes. There's romance in the movie. Yes. There is romance. There is, is he going to get the girl? Is he not going to get the girl? There are a lot of traditional values in this that you don't see in other films. And also the other thing that I did like about the movie was the positivity. It's very mm -hmm. positive in spite of struggles that the family is going through. At the beginning of the movie, we see that they're they're losing their house you know they're they're but they're but they're together as a family. The only thing that matters is they are together. Sholo, the family dynamic, um, all of those things I really love. Now let's get into the problems. <laughs> the Blue Beetle as a character, which I am not a fan of a superhero that is created by I found a thing and now I'm a superhero. Like, oh, I found a ring that shoots out green lasers. I'm a hero. You know, I found this. I'm a hero now. Someone mailed me bracelets. <laughs> Someone mailed me bracelets in the mail. I'm a hero now. Oh, I found, I got these other bracelets or the 10 rings. I'm a hero now. I don't like a superhero origin that is sort of dependent on I found something. The other thing is, is they try to do this kind of Iron Man dynamic where he talks mm. to the scarab, which is, um, what's the scarab's name? It's like, Cola or something. It's there's a there's a I forget the name oh, of uh, Ka Kajada. Kajada. Kaja, yeah, something like that. He's always talking to, but he's had odds in it. It's like he's just in the suit, and the suit is doing all the superheroing, at least at yeah. the beginning, and he's not. And the other thing is, you've got you know this uh, very likable, attractive actor Sholo, Sholo, and you don't see his face for most of the movie. And what I realize is there are scenes where he's in the Blue Beetle costume, and you see his face. It matters. It's not just some, some sort of like Power Rangers thing where you don't see the reaction. When you see his character, Jaime Reyes, like react like fear and anger and just like determination, it means something. And it's sort of annoying to watch just this faceless thing. It's why. Yeah, he, you know, he's screaming through most of the action sequences. He's screaming, but like in the end, he there's some scenes. This isn't like a big spoiler thing, but you see his face, and he's in the costume, 
And it, it meant more. It meant a lot more. Why hide this guy's face? So I don't know. I'm sure that would have changed the blue beetle or whatever, but I really, I think, I think it, it, it meant a lot, but this movie on the negative side just felt like spy kids to me because a lot of the humor was very based. It felt very super simple. Susan Sarandon is playing Hillary Clinton as a villain. She is literally Hillary Clinton. It's ridiculous. It's so dumb. Um, I'm sorry, there are politicians watching this live stream and you've yeah. insulted every single politician. Yes, I've insulted politicians who are phony and effectively actors. And if, But if politicians want to super chat, feel free. <laughs> um, in any case... Uh, well, that's why I mean, you you brought it up. I, the most the first half of the movie is just the suit doing things for him. So he's not again the hero's journey. He's not learning anything. He's just kind of the host of this the symbiote. And and when you talk about you know what was the what was the overall message of the film? How did they ultimately defeat the bad guy? It's the theme was basically my family is better than your family. That's it. That's it. You know, and uh, and I'm. You know, as good as that is, and as much as we want to promote family in in movies nowadays, um, it, it's not that that's not how you beat bad guys. You know, well, there's the, there is that personal journey that we all connect with. Well, this movie uh, and, gets. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. You go ahead. Yeah, no, it's just you know this this is the, you know I guess Luke Skywalker would be the the you know the ultimate version of the ultimate idea of what that hero's journey is. You know, someone who has to overcome odds to to over to to win out in the end, and this one just didn't have that. It was, hey, the family's working together to beat the bad guy, and that and that was that's your story, that's your story. But but it's the, I this movie gets points for me because of the strong family dynamic, mm -hmm. and there is a scene with Sholo or oh, excuse me, not Sholo, Jaime and his father that got me that I thought was very powerful mm -hmm. um, toward in the third act. I'm not going to ruin it, but it's a scene between him and his father. I thought it was very good. I thought, I thought it was really good in sort of a mixed bag of this felt like it could be a Disney plus show or it felt sort of spy kids and it felt spy kids mainly because of the, the gadgets, all the gadgets um, from Ted cord. They kind of use Ted cord is, I hope this isn't considered a spoiler from people, but he's a presence. You actually get to see the old classic from the 80s Blue Beetle costume is in there. Uh, Ted Cord is not in the movie, but he was a previous Blue Beetle, you know, trying to mm -hmm. um, backwards engineer the scarab and couldn't do it. But from that was able to build all these like fun gadgets that existed. So he is acknowledged as being a hero from the past. And Jaime is the hero of the present. He's the blue. blue I'll be blue. honest. When when that was brought into the movie, that's to me that's when the movie picked up. You know, right, right. Like, but oh, middle okay. uh, middle of the film, they go to his lair. Uh, Jenny Cord takes him to the lair. But like the movie gets points for like, hey, like it's not like they were trying. And I say like like um you know they didn't like unless they didn't make like Rudy Reyes, which is George Lopez's character. They didn't make him like gay or like you know what I mean. That sort of pandering yeah. stuff that Marvel and, and the context of the line everyone hates is now brought brought into right. the picture. It's like. Okay, now it's now we understand where that line comes from and why he said it, which, yeah, whoever did the trailer needs to be fired. Right, right, but that was funny. It was funny, and by the way, there is a cut scene. Can I tell you this? Okay, this is a. It's not a spoiler because it's not in the movie, but <laughs> I was told by someone who saw a three-hour version of Blue Beetle, there's a cut scene. It was like a mid-credit scene. Where uh, Rudy Reyes, which is the uncle that uttered the I uttered the the, the words, the that man is a fascist. He in a mid credit scene, he gets a phone call, and he says, and it's Ben Affleck Batman voice, and he says, "So I'm a fascist." Cut from the how movie. Would, how would Batman have known he said that? Well, like, that's exactly right. It was yeah. just meant to be a joke, oh, but okay. um, it was a mid credit scene that was cut from the film. So make of that what you will. Well, uh, one thing I'll add is, um, okay, so I'm not Latino. I know very little about Latino culture in, in any way to make me 
say anything with authority, but I will say, you know, I, I feel like, uh, I mean, look, I like Shang-Chi. I like Shang-Chi a lot. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that as a Chinese American, um, it was very familiar to me in terms of uh, the cultural things that were brought into that movie. Um, even the ending, the, the weird land they went to, you see all these weird creatures. Look, I've been to a lot of Chinese banquets and, and these weird creatures live, uh, you know, we see them in, in our banquets, the lion, the lion dancing, the dragon dancing, and it was right there. And, and it was just like, wow, they, they whoever, you know, uh, Shang-Chi at least got the culture right. And, uh, and just to go on a limb here, uh, I feel like. You know, maybe the the same feeling for for Latino, uh, for Latino community is felt with Blue Beetle. Yeah, well, I do know that like Paulie from Latino Slant is very high on this film. He loves it, and I think if it got Latino culture wrong, he would have noticed. It is a fictional city, like the movie takes place in this fictional city. Because I'm like, wait a sec, is this taking place in Mexico? Palmero City. <laughs> yeah, Palmero City. It's so it's a it's it's a totally fictional city that's sort of a slightly in the future, maybe a few years in the future version of this city, maybe five years in the future kind of feels like from the technology. Um, but a lot of this just felt very spy kids, very like, I mean, the, the action itself, there's some decent action sequences, but a lot of the stuff is just sort of like dumb, like especially with regard to Susan Sarandon's character, She's just a completely one-dimensional villain. And all I could think was, I got like super Hillary Clinton vibes from her. Like an evil Hillary Clinton. And, you know, uh, make of that what you will. Just like everything about her was totally cartoonish. And I didn't, I like, and then she has this sort of heavy that ends up, you know, being like a main villain with, with a twist. I won't get into it. We're not going to yeah, talk. But you can figure right it out. <laughs> you can figure it out. But um, I mean, overall, if this movie is, you know, uh, it's just sort of mid tier. And I even said, like, I don't know how the, well this movie is going to perform. But I'll say this. Even if it's good, I don't know that, like, if it's considered good by most people, I don't know that that's enough to have it do well at the box office. I just don't know because there is that fatigue, right? Like you can, you can, you can mock that term all you want. It's real. It's, we have seen these stories before, which is why when I'm hearing the dialogue, I'm like, I've heard this in a million other movies, you know, it's the scientist, it's this, oh, we're on a, you know what I mean? It's like almost none of the situations that occur in this film haven't already been done in previous films. You know, in a way, it's like a human version of AI in the sense that we're seeing these scenes play out that we've seen many times before, you know, in other movies. Uh, the the evil head of the corporation, the this, it's like, well, what? I mean, it's not the originality is not this film's strength. And a lot of people have even compared the suit and the way it works to Guyver. Another film, a film where the costume itself is the host or Venom. Uh, this is sort of like, you know, good Venom, I guess. But I, overall, I kind of walked out saying, I can't say I, I didn't enjoy parts of the movie, but I didn't love it. I was not completely in love with it. I, but I was in love with aspects of it, which were the family dynamic, strong father, father-son relationship and romance what's missing in modern movies today romance although i thought the romance was played pretty junior high which is fine but yeah you're right it seemed there were like, like a couple like because the one thing about uh jaime reyes like every time he puts the suit on it burns his clothes and his shoes off so when he comes out of the suit he's completely naked every time and it's just weird so, yeah, uh, I, I mean, you put it, re you hit the nail on the head, Alan, when you said that, like, look, how, is this going to appeal to uh, families with young kids? I don't know when you've got like is all the nudity and it's all suggested. Everything's handled very, mm -hmm. you know, it's 
handled in a joking manner, right? Um, but uh, you can only have so many dick jokes and boner jokes. And some of the violence, like towards the end of the movie, I, I don't want to go into detail, but some of the stuff is graphic where people are being, I mean, not bloody, it's not blood, it's bloodless violence, but you've got people being stepped on and crushed and stabbed and like people being murdered, you know, I mean, they're, I guess they're justified because it's the good guys versus the bad guys. So the faceless bad guys, faceless minions are being slaughtered and murdered and killed. And uh, that's fine. But Jaime even says, like, I'm not going to kill. I'm not going to kill. But other people do. Yeah. And, they, and people, that was the weird thing. He goes, I, I, I don't want to kill. I don't want to kill. And then you see people getting killed. You not see a lot him, of people getting by, killed. But by his... By by members of his family. That's by true. member of his family, members of his family just murdering. Uh, and and another <laughs> uh, another on the positive side is Nana. Right. Yeah. I mean, Nana is his Nana that that happened. could have been done so wrong. That, it, yeah. That it, I liked her. Yeah. She has this, this dark past, so she has this machine gun, and she's like very excited about that, and she's like planning. She's just sort of the innocent Nana mm -hmm. and then she comes out of her shell. So it's a mixed bag. They're like things I really liked about it. And then then um, it's just it's sort of a uh, it's superhero spy kids. Uh, and it's and it's and, and there you go. Yeah. So I don't know. I would rate it probably a six. Yeah, I put it, it around six. there. Put it around six, maybe six point five. But uh, look and look. If it was made for 150 million dollars, uh, congratulations. That that's yes. to me. That's how superhero movies need to be. That's the budget superhero movies need to have. You know, it has a shot at making money now. Yeah. So, so let's. Uh, so there you go. Six out of ten, and um, better than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. It's actually better than I thought it would be. But it's because my expectations were so low. I think that audiences, I, I'm curious to see how audiences respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll only add that you should you should be able to take kids to this movie, and you may not want to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here we go. Let's go to your comments and questions here. Shagadoo for five. They just painted the Rocky Steps here in Philly as Blue Beetle ad, as a bu Blue Beetle ad. Atrocious. <laughs> I think Philly's got way more problems than that. Uh, I've been seeing some viral videos coming out of Philly lately. There are some big freaking problems in that city. Big problems. Robert Paul Champagne for 199. I enjoy Blue Beetles that settle in crunchy bushes. Well, there mm, you are. Yes. And Squibbs says, what was good? The end credits? Well, you needed to hear the review for that. Yeah. Um, Blue Beetle was originally intended for HBO Max that got promoted to theatrical a la Evil Dead Rise. I think this is missed, said Sons and Shadows. Mm -hmm. Was it really supposed to be a, a HBO Max show? Yeah, I think there was an interview with the director, uh, but I haven't heard it, so I can't okay. give any details on that. Uh, Edge... Scarborough says, I'm still confused why in America jokes or swear words are worse than violence. It's not that. It, it's not that. It's it's that if you had taken them out, you could have broadened your audience, allowed younger kids to get into the movie, uh, or you know, you have you don't have to worry about it. I'm just saying, hey, money, you want to make money by doing that, you broaden the audience as, as wide as you can. Gotcha. But yeah, I like swear words are fun. Is it PG 13? Uh, yes, it is PG-13. Can confirm, says Zavin. Uh, Rumble, 8LS24. So it's possible to make a superhero film for under $150 million? Who'd have guessed? And it looks, production-wise, this looks expensive. Mm -hmm. It does look, and I will say this, you know what? You know, it was, the CG in this is better than The Flash. The CG is objectively better than The Flash. Mm -hmm. It just is. Buford and, and they probably planned better too. They probably. I'm pretty better. sure that's how they kept it kept the budget down. It's it's a very straightforward. These are straightforward action sequences. They they're not doing fixing things in post. So. 
Buford T. Justice says, I'm shocked Polly loved the movie. I'm not shocked at all. Yeah, Polly's like, either. are there Latino people in it? A plus. Love you, Polly. But that's Polly. Polly is, uh, and I love Polly's enthusiasm. So I loved his enthusiasm. There you go. There were no Asians in it, though. That's that's all I'm saying. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bemo Better sub supporter on Rumble says the structure of this movie sounds very generic, down to the villain being a bigger, badder version of the hero. Yawn. Uh, you're right. That is 100. percent This movie is. Ge- if if you just retitle this generic superhero movie, that's this movie. Alan, would you agree? I'm sorry. What was that? Sorry, we're having an issue with the chat right now, and so uh, what's the issue with the chat? Um, I'm not seeing new chats. Uh, Miss P Coffee wasn't, she went out, came back in, and now it's normal. I, I don't know if you're seeing all the chats or not. I'm seeing the starred chat, so I'm going through them right now, okay. but I don't see the live chat, so apparently it's yeah. not working. Well, StreamYard, there you go. Going to be an interesting show today. Why don't you bring up uh, YouTube so we can maybe live comment? to what some okay. people are saying. Bring up YouTube on another screen and we'll continue to do that. And we appreciate all of your comments, whether you agree with us or not. Whether you're an actor who's an ungrateful actor uh, who was hired by Disney and paid a lot of money to play something only to bash the original work for which you were hired or not, we appreciate you watching. Uh, very positive. I must have missed all the white bashing. Says Jacob P. <laughs> um, I don't know that there's. There oh, I don't think there was any overt like white bashing. I mean, there's bashing of the villains, Susan Sarandon. But I kind of like the idea that I think I really think that Susan Sarandon was channeling Hillary Clinton. Tell me if I'm wrong. But I just got this like, this is like what Hillary Clinton is like when she's not on camera. Is she's just like Susan Sarandon in Blue Beetle. So there you go. Geek Truth 64 says even Smallville managed to have Blue Beetle and Booster Gold together. I think Booster Gold could have given it a more unique story element. Yes, Booster Gold is not in this. My understanding is Booster Gold will be introduced in James Gunn's DC universe, which I'm looking forward to seeing. Jacob, and then another comment from Jacob P. I don't like movies just because they show my culture. That kind of stuff doesn't sell me. Well, talk to Paulie. <laughs> talk to Paulie on that. He's By the way, Paulie has out. a comment here. Uh, really? What did Paulie yeah. say? Because I can't. Says, you all talking shit. Please subscribe to the slant. Gracias. Yeah. And then a, a subscribe to the Latino podcast. slant. Yeah. I always plug your stuff, Paulie. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Then, then I'm being accused of being a little race obsessed, just because there's no Asians in this movie. It's, and where, uh, first of all, mean? I know Alan is joking when he says that. So, Mister D Man Twenty One says they removed the story from El Paso, a real city, and just used a made up one. I believe the made up one is from the comics. I know the DCU has made up cities, but come on, they're they're That's pretty on par with DC, right? They were some things that I found a little distracting where they talk about, you know, what it's like to be an alien and this and the struggles and all that. And like, I just felt like it was a little too on the nose on commenting on current day politics, a little too on the nose, but you know, whatever, it's fine. Alan, other comments from YouTube because we can't see them. And I want to thank Matt Filippelli for becoming a YouTube member. Thank you, Matt. See you on discord. Yeah. Appreciate uh, Zavin that. says, I think my biggest problem with the movie not having Ted Cord is it feels like uh, skipping Iron Man to go straight to Iron Heart. As the comic book fan, that rubs me the wrong way. Huh. Well, there you go. I'm going to try and refresh the page and see if that fixes it for me. Yeah, I think I might go away for a second. I mean, you know, if you go out of the studio and come back in, um, I think it'll. Yeah, so uh, Chris is doing that. Let me let me just get to another one. Uh, let me see. Uh, Aura Honeydew says, I kind of wish the DC movies would use real cities except Gotham and Metropolis 
kind of how George Miller wanted to, for uh, wanted for his canceled uh, Justice League Mortal movie. Um, that fixed it. That fixed yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me do it. And uh... all right, come back, Alan. Come back. Okay. While Alan's gone, I'm gonna I'm gonna play. <laughs> I'm going to play a video that maybe some of you haven't seen. So uh, where is that? Alan, do you love refrigerator? I love refrigerator. <laughs> you love refrigerator. There you go. All right. We're back. We're back. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, comment here from Audrey, Audrey, Aura Honeydew says, I kind of wish the DC movies would use real cities except Gotham and Metropolis. Kind of how George Miller wanted for his canceled Justice League Mortal movie. Well, it's interesting because, you know, when you see the world, it looks like the Earth but it's a different kind of earth with different cities. I actually don't mind it. The fictional cities are fine by me. Uh, I just want to know the geography because I was incredibly confused about where they were because it felt like they were in Mexico. But they were Now they not. mentioned that they were they they lived in the Keys, in the Florida Keys. Yeah. So, I must have missed that the one time I went to the bathroom. It's weird imagining Susan Sarandon as the villain, says Jocelyn. And Susan was not a Hillary supporter, says John Carter. Oh, I know. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> so, so there you go. Um, continuing with your comments and questions here, we have some super chats that have come in. Let's go to those. And we have other movies to talk about today. Um, Master Deimos for five says, Blue Beetle was a good movie. I left the theater in a happy mood. See? Yeah. And you know what? I'm not going to yuck your yum. There are things to like about the film. That The thing that turned me on it was the scene with Jaime and his father. Turned you positive so, on it, you're saying? Yeah, turned me positive on it instead of, I mean, like, it's I'm, to me, five and down is negative. Five and under is negative. Five and above is positive. This is, for me, a six because it had positive aspects. Um, but, you know, there are things to like. So, uh, Shinatsky's for 199 says, actors insult us constantly. Welcome to the club. Yeah, I would say that there is an oversensitivity of actors to criticism. And it is a thing that is very vulnerable. You're, you're literally laying your soul, your image, your, you know, everything bare. You're emotionally naked on camera, let's say. But um, there is a certain professionalism that I miss mm -hmm. uh, coming from actors these days. And Rachel Zegler is among the least professional and least appreciative. Yeah. And it reflects badly on other people in that field. So take it up with Rachel, in my opinion. Take it up with Rachel. But I'll say from a personal standpoint, I've always been more interested in actor, excuse me, in directors and writers than talking to actors. And I have met some incredibly intelligent actors and had uh, really great conversations, but that is a rarity. That is not the norm. Thomas Pickett for five says, are, are you telling me I shouldn't trust Matthew McConaughey selling me a Lincoln? Well, he's an actor. So there you go. Uh, thank you, Thomas Pickett for that. Uh, and Thomas Pickett, uh, for five, maybe we missed this. He says, it is offensive and ironic to make Hispanic people immigrants. They were here before we emigrated from Caucasia. Uh, I don't know that. Like, I don't, I can't confirm well, that. I, fact. Well, if, you, if you've seen American Homeboy, you would know that that was true. Well, that, okay, well, there you go. I, I need to see American Homeboy. I really want to see it. Um, but uh, the one one thing is that I I don't like stereotypes. I like, you know, and also I, the thing is, is, stereotypes are that like a certain people is always a certain way that shouldn't always be true. People, oh. I, I like to judge people as individuals, not as types. 
You know, that's the sort of, you know, it, it, I see people as just like, this is, Polly is Polly. And Polly has many sides to Polly. But I don't put Polly in a box of like, you know, that that I would expect him to be a certain way. I think that that's sort of um, ignorant and uh, uh, sort of whatever. So there you go. Um, yeah. Are we still having problems with the comments? No, that, um, yeah, no, we're, we're, we're going over something, uh, but no, keep going. We're good. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, so there you go. Bottom line. Uh, and, and I don't know, should we get into spoilers here? I don't know. We should do, I mean, the chat wants to, but um, something tells me, I think we've talked this one out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we um with the, the okay. So there's other things that we needed. So Blue Beetle, like, look, we'll we'll um maybe we'll talk spoilers at the end of the show. But for now, there's other stuff we want to talk about. We have other movies that have opened this weekend that we want to discuss. Um, in addition, I have seen episode one and two of Ahsoka. Before we talk about Ahsoka, let's talk about another film, and we're gonna pivot very quickly. And we're going to discuss, we're going to discuss Ahsoka, episode one and two, and we're going to. <laughs> Let's talk about a movie that Alan and I both saw. It is a raunchy comedy, R-rated comedy called Strays. Strays is, looks on the surface to be one of those cliche talking animal movies where they're on a journey of discovery. Uh, Jamie Foxx plays a, a little dog named Bug. Will Ferrell is the main character, plays a dog named Reggie. Will Forte is an asshole who plays Doug, who owns Reggie, the dog. And Reggie ruined his relationship. Reggie, uh, uh, Reggie ruined Doug's relationship with a girl that he had. He's caught cheating. Because of Reggie, he basically masturbates, plays video games, and smokes weed all day. Doug is incredibly unlikable. And unbeknownst to Reggie, Doug loathes and despises Reggie the dog. So much so that Doug keeps driving him out further and further. And no matter how far he drives Reggie, little Reggie dog finds his way back to Doug. And he considers it a game that they play. This game, and of course, uh, Will Forte, who's just a horribly disgusting human in this, uh, despises Reggie the little dog, and the, the dog just takes it as love. He takes it as love. Finally, he's driven out so far and left to his own devices that he's having a little trouble finding his way home, which is when he runs into a uh, bug and other animals uh, there's one called Maggie, played by Isla Fisher, and Randall Park plays Hunter, who's got this cone on his on his head. And uh, it, we follow these dogs, Bug, Reggie, Maggie, and Hunter, on their journey back to Doug, back to the back to his owner, and they have a series of raunchy adventures. And there are jokes about having sex with couches. There are jokes about dogs having sex with other dogs. There are jokes about sniffing dogs' butts. I don't know who this is for. Uh, it's it, it might have made a better short film. The film has its, has its moments, but as a comedy, I, I expected to laugh throughout. I didn't. Uh, I, I would give this like a five or less in terms of a rating, maybe between a four and a five. Didn't love the film. It 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 has sort of this raunchy, gross payoff at the end, uh, involving Doug, which is totally predictable. Uh, it's it's an interesting idea. It seems like this would have made a better fake trailer for a movie on SNL back when SNL was good. But as a film, it I mean, thankfully, it's only like around ninety minutes. You know, it doesn't. I mean, it kind of overstayed its welcome for me. But I think that there are going to be families that accidentally go to see this movie 
and not realize that it's a raunchy R-rated film. Uh, whether kids catch it on television or a family's like, look, a cute dog movie. Let's go see this. I think you're going to see a lot of refunds coming from families uh, and, and, and strays. I don't know. I just was like, I, I even like, I was, it's not even, it's not even a genre film. I like when it's good. So this is the R rated version and the raunchy R rated, you know, it's not, um, Seth Rogen didn't have anything to do with this, but he may as well, he may as well have had something to do with it. But so if it's a bad comedy, Seth Rogen has to be involved in it. Right. If it's a bad comedy and there's weed involved, Seth Rogen is probably involved, except he's not involved. But I, I, I did not. I walked out of it just thinking, ugh, ugh, why did I watch that? Alan, what did you think of Strays? Yeah, it's weird. I think you and I feel the same way about the movie, but I would probably actually recommend it. Um, Barely, barely. It, you know, it, it's the, the whole movie is based on an idea, a, a humorous idea of, you know, the talking lost dog movies. And instead of it being cute, all the dogs are swearing. I mean, how many times is the F-bomb dropped in this in this movie? Um, which is fine. You know, uh, they're, they're swearing. There are dick jokes, but it's more appropriate in this one. Um, but it just, you know, it, you after a while, you just realize that the joke is cute dog saying the F word. Uh, and, um, you know, but, but there, I think there are enough funny moments, you know, paced out throughout the film that, that I'm going to give it a, a bare recommendation if, you know, I wouldn't say it's the funniest movie ever. I certainly laughed. Um, this is definitely one of those movies that if I were to see it again, it will probably be playing on this TV here while I'm cleaning up the room. <laughs> you know, so, you know, I'm, I'm hard pressed to say, I mean, I like the animation. I like the way they use the dogs. I like, you know, animation. it was clever. Oh, oh, the animation of the yeah, mouth. The, the facial, yeah, 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 the mouth animations. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's. Yeah, but but I think it does border on a joke that is just drawn out too long. Um, but ultimately, I think I walked away feeling feeling good about the movie. Uh, and it's probably because Seth Rogen wasn't involved in it. <laughs> <laughs> I liked it. So, uh, so, yeah, I mean, like Big Short or, yeah, is it Big Short, that new movie coming or that the GameStop movie? You know, Seth Rogen. Dumb, there. dumb I'm, money. Dumb, dumb money. money. I'm not yeah. looking forward to that one. Uh, and mostly because of Seth Rogen. But, um, you know, this one, you know, so, yeah, it's not groundbreaking, but, yeah, it's fun. It's definitely better than Hollywood Land Murders, which, well, is, which is puppets swearing and having sex. Well, a mild recommendation from you, a mm -hmm. non-recommendation from me. It just got gross and annoying. And here, this is a thing. I might lose half the audience now when I say this. I'm about to make a very controversial statement. I'm not a dog person. I'm not a dog person. I find dogs to be needy. I find where's your dog, Alan? She's, well, I'm uh, right there. there you go. There's your dog. Um, I, I'm not a dog person. And I find them to be needy. I find them to be like sort of like it's like owning a four-year-old that can't talk. And, and I find maybe part of it is, well, look, Bill S. Preston S. Esquire, unsubscribe. Chris, yeah. you are dead to me, says Razorburn. But let me let me tell you, it's, it's mainly because not so much about how I feel about dogs, because dogs love me. Like, uh, dogs, whatever, like, I don't know, they just, they just love me. Maybe it's a little alpha energy I give off. I don't know, but I've had my experiences, dogs tend to love me, and it gets a little irritating. I'll just say it's a little irritating, yeah. but it's how people in Los Angeles treat dogs that bothers me. People in Los Angeles treat dogs better than homeless people in Los Angeles. Facts. And it, it bothers me that in a way dogs have replaced children for so many single people in, 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 this, in particular, at least maybe this is a, this is a West coast thing. But it's, it's, I see how people treat their dogs and it's like, gee, you like, there are homeless people living in tents and, you know, 
uh, you won't find any homeless dogs. You'll just see, you'll just see like dogs and, 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 you know, there's so many. And when someone says they're a dog lover, like I get it. I understand how you could like dogs. I'm more of a cat person. I've had cats. Like I don't currently own a cat. Uh, what are you putting up all these comments, <laughs> Alan? Making fun of me. But it's really like, it's like, it's so annoying the way LA people treat dogs. It's turned me off to dogs. I have no problem with the dogs themselves, but LA people treat their dogs like, because they're, this is, I'm talking about mainly childless women. Childless women treat their dogs like their kids. So I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. And that's maybe part of the reason why I didn't love the movie as much as you did, Alan. That's, you know, what can I say? So you, you resonated with the Will, Fer uh, Will Forte character. No, I would never be, first of all, I would never be mean or cruel to an animal. Never, ever. Uh, like that I found loathsome, his character. I just didn't like the character at all, his character. I'm not, you know, I just... If I have a preference, I prefer cats. So you know, it's just this running theme that they they have. Well, it's Zootopia. I don't think Zootopia is Pixar. It's not. It's a Disney. It's Disney. It's a Disney. Racist, even though I guess, but you know, it's the father who doesn't want her daughter. That film <laughs> that we just showed is better than Strays. <laughs> Let's go to your comments and questions. Feel free to roast me for not being a dog person. Uh, so, so there you go. Let's go. Let's go to your super chats first. Prioritizing those. Rudy says, "Hey, Chris. Apparently, you go to the same theater as me in Burbank. That's the AMC Burbank 16. If I ever run into you, drinks are on me, man. We'll just say hi." You can see me there. I'm there pretty much every Thursday. Thank you. Or at Rudy. the Yard House. You'll be in. Or at Yard House. Yeah. Two Penny Puppet for 499 says George Lopez has spent the last eight years ruthlessly insulting conservatives. The heck with him and everything he's involved with. Yeah, that is annoying. I find that annoying. I the whole purpose of this country is that we can disagree and coexist. And when actors step out and want to vilify, like some of the stuff I've seen Ron Perlman say, or Mark yeah. Hamill has soured me on them as people. They there's, there's this complete lack of empathy. Hollywood used to love, uh, love blue collar workers and they do not anymore. I'm going to tweet that later today. I'm going to tweet that. Um, Crazy Cat for 199. Which do you hate more, Chris? Actors or dogs? Let's just say this. Actors who are dog owners, who don't have children. That's who I don't like. Clip that for a short, Glenn. Yeah. Actors who have dogs who are childless. Does that make sense? Thank you, Crazy Cat, for your 199. We appreciate it. Uh, continuing here. Wait, I'm sorry. I've lost myself here. Thank you, Rudy. I'm going to run into Rudy. From Rumble, Winter Soldier sub supporter. That is a hard call cocaine bear. You saw the funny parts in the Red Band trailer. Strays, there are better parts that are not in the trailer. Well, that's true. Yeah. Uh, there are better parts in the movie that are not in the trailer. Fair point. Yeah. Like when uh, they try to get the key. Carnell says, I think you dislike the owners more than the dogs themselves. That's true. I had a, um, I had a friend once who was upset when her dog would come, I'd come over to her place and her dog would come and sit in my lap and her dog let me do things to the dog. That is like, you know, a little scratching behind the ear, a little like under the neck here and a little scratchy on the back and right above the tail. I know that I know the, I know the places dog, dogs like. I know where to scratch. And this dog would sit in my lap and 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 um, treat me better than its owner. So I have no Please problem. Sit, 
Someone oh, clip that, please. Okay, keep going. <laughs> there are too many clippable things today. I know. Um, but yeah, you're right. I dislike uh, the dog owners because because they treat their dogs like children and babies. And I, I just, I'm like, they're a dog. I'm not prioritizing um, the family pet over humans or people. I'm not. I'm just not. And what the, the problem I have is people who prioritize pets over people. And when you look around Los Angeles and you see how far this city has fallen in such a short time, with a profound lack of political will and leadership to fix the problems of LA. And when I see people treat their dogs so well, and I, I see homeless and drug, drug addicts on the street treated less than human, I get a little upset at that. Thank you, Carnell, for your comment. I appreciate it. And you get me. You get me. Um, it's like idiocracy. Rich, responsible people have dogs, while poor, irresponsible people have tons of children, says the Downtown Movie Lounge. Thank you for that. From Rumble, Winter Soldier sub-supporter. Chris knows how to touch puppies. I just know what dog... I'm empathetic. I like... Yeah, empathy, that's it. Yeah. What's wrong yeah. with that? I know where to scratch. Gore 2024, <laughs> says Spidey Sensei 72. Holy War says... I know how to turn dogs on, says from Holy Wars. Crazy Cat says, Chris has never been to the ghetto. There are homeless dogs all over the place. Um, I've driven through. Yes, I know where you're talking. There are bad parts of L.A. And By the way, Leo Cody, uh, you know, this is a great time. Chris, Chris wants more videos of him. Right, but we'll <laughs> see. Uh, the Nerd Far Away, it's not just in L.A., Chris. They're like that here, too. I am not fond of the term dog mom or the term my doggos, like my kiddos. I find those people stupid. When you're, you know, like, and, and to me, you know, we could use some more good parenting in the world. And the amount of money I've seen people spend and the way people have treated their dogs or, or it's like you should just be a parent be a parent so this is catastrophic alan this is your channel now says crabby <laughs> patty never getting to six hundred and ninety thousand or sixty nine thousand subscribers now we're already past that says fx ktp2 geek true 64 says any dog under 50 pounds is a cat and cats are pointless ron swanson i love ron swanson Ron Swanson on Parks and Rec. I'm I'm Ron Swanson. I'm like, I have just low tolerance for certain things. I'm common sense approach to everything. I think a lot of things are BS. So Chris will never have a more controversial take than this, <laughs> says Adel is 24 from Rumble. What? Like. Yeah, you thought Crunchy Bush was controversial. Yeah. And Vanguard sends in 499. No comment, just to support there. Um, missed Super Chat, amount unknown, from Matthew Hammond. You said evil Hillary Clinton character. Isn't evil a superfluous term? Well, that's what I was thinking. Like, literally, it's like, okay, for anyone who hasn't seen Blue Beetle yet, or if you've seen it, Susan Sarandon is Hillary Clinton. That's just, she just is. So, there you go. Uh, comment here from Winter's Soldier sub supporter from Rumble. I saw Strays a few weeks ago at a GoFobo screening. I was not impressed, but then again, the audience was a bunch of senior citizens who obviously didn't get the jokes. Uh, Jocelyn said that Photoshop and Chris and Allen in the poster, though, can't unsee it, says Jocelyn. Well, yes, if you go to the community tab on the Film Threat YouTube channel, uh, Leo Cody makes these weird movie poster renditions of Alan and I, and they're ridiculous. They're ridiculous, and we appreciate it. Mike MC Wong said, too much shit, parentheses, literally, in the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just like after a while, it's just like, there was so much shit, it just was whatever. And this is, it is um, 8 Ellis 24 from Rumble, Homeward Bound for Adults. That's what this movie is. 
and I cannot recommend it. Alan recommends it. Right. Your mileage may vary. Bring they should they missed an opportunity to do the best promotion for this movie. Can I just say what this is? The best promotion for strays should have been those little like plastic things that you you put on your hand where you pick up the poop, put strays on it, and give them away for free to dog owners. Maybe one of the reasons I'm not a dog person, don't like poop that much. I don't like to clean it. I don't like to, I don't like the outdoors as a toilet. I got my own schedule. I'm not on my dog's schedule. You know, I like a friend or, uh, you know, a child who knows how to use the restroom. And a dog doesn't know how to use the restroom. Final comments here. What about the critical doggo, says Zombie Judo? Critical doggo gets a total pass. <laughs> Love the critical doggo because I have zero responsibility and I can watch the critical doggo during open bar. Love the critical doggo. What's wrong with that? So there you go. And KG Jung says, well, Alan recommends it if you're cleaning your room. Yes. It it replace it replaces Eternals as my room cleaning movie. <laughs> All right, let's pivot. We're gonna pivot again to another film, a completely different movie. That I I don't know if Alan has seen this film or Which not. Which one? Uh, I don't know if Alan has seen this film. So, Depends on which one you're going to next. Well, we'll see. Um, we have a someone is just. Hi, Dad. I miss you. I'm really curious what what your daughter thinks of strays. Oh my lord, my god. Dad, help me. Okay, this is weird. This is weird. My real daughter felt the same way. <laughs> All right, yes, let's I see this movie. Yeah. And in fact, uh, in fact I interviewed story. the writer director uh, on the Film Threat Interviews channel, Corey Finley. Well, here we go. Dogs are greater than crunchy beavers, says Samuel Schweiger, for two CHF, whatever those are. Uh, so there you go. So there you go. Uh, all right. Let's talk about a film, a different type of film. Those are Swiss Frank, CHF currency. Let's talk about what is... One of my favorite films that I have seen this year. It's an independent film directed by Corey Finley, who did a film previously that I saw and interviewed him for called Thoroughbreds. Look up the trailer for Thoroughbreds. Look up Thoroughbreds on video on demand. Landscape with Invisible Hand is based on a science fiction novel about a future Earth in which aliens have made contact with humans not only have they made contact, they have uh, become entrepreneurial with humans. And effectively, what's now happened is Earth is populated by the underclass that lives on the surface of Earth, covered in junk and tent cities and homeless people and people who can barely afford apartments or dwellings and these giant floating cities where all the rich people live. These aliens called the Uva Uvu Uvu or they're called the Uv, like, uh, Uv called the Uv are these slug like creatures that um, they speak in a language that involves scratching their paws, and the scratching of the paws is translated. Uh, Adam is the lead character who is an aspiring artist. He's in high school, and you see the history of his family and even contact with aliens through his artwork. He's an ambitious, plucky young kid who meets Chloe, who is a homeless person living on the streets with her dad and her brother. And Adam and Chloe have romantic interests. They also are taught using a device that attaches to your head that's kind of like a VR set so when you attach this to your head, you're taught by the Uv creatures. 
All of this I'm describing is incredibly bizarre, but you can see it in the trailer. What ends up happening is the two characters, Adam and Chloe, they have a crush on each other. And in order to make money, they monetize their relationship. And in a way, a lot of this relationship is like being on YouTube. They get, they, they, they attach it. They attach their, these devices to their heads. So you're not only seeing what they're doing, you are feeling their feelings. And the OOV, because they don't understand humans, they use these shows, which are like these YouTube shows, to understand humans and how they feel. Because they have a, they, they don't fall, they don't have love, they don't mate the same way, and they find humans fascinating. So effectively, humans are doing YouTube shows for aliens. And Adam and Chloe are uh, monetizing their relationship. They have fun. They make out. They watch movies together. And they get not only more and more viewers, but more and more money. Chloe's family moves in with Adam's family. It's a little rough and tumble. And then because of some problems, Adam and Chloe maybe don't like each other as much as they did initially. Their high school romance kind of begins to wane. And there's a violation, kind of like on YouTube when you get a violation, you have a problem, you've broken the terms of service. This is what happens to Adam and Chloe. And they are called up to one of the, the, the to meet with one of the OOV in the, in the city to dispute this, dispute this, this breaking of the terms of service because they're not actually authentically in love, but they're doing a show called Adam and Chloe in Love. This is a satire on what's happening now in our world. It's about class disparity. It's about social media influencers and what it costs you. It's about empathy and, and what it means to be human. It is the weirdest film I have seen this year. It is so incredibly well done in terms of its world building. This movie comes to us from Plan B, which is Brad Pitt's company. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm saying these things to you about what the story is, trying to explain it to the best of my ability. <laughs> but it is absolutely, it's, it's in my top films of the year. I don't know if it'll be in the top 10, in my top films of the year. And it does what great science fiction does well, which is what the pod generation did very well, which is it introduces an, a concept that changes humanity. And it's how humanity reacts to this concept, which is the idea that there are aliens, which is just accepted. And the aliens basically solve everyone's problems on Earth, except what that does, it takes away purpose. And you see the despair and the depression that plagues almost everyone. In an opening scene, uh, the these little VR headsets, which they, they're uh, devices that attach to the side of your temple. This is this is their version of VR headsets, and the teacher is no longer needed because they're just going to teach through these videos. And the teacher commits suicide, and you see the level of despair. You see homeless people living under a bridge. This movie may be science fiction. It's about now. It's about the elites turning their backs on working people. This movie should resonate with everyone because it's so it's so much better in tune than Hollywood movies. Mm -hmm. So bravo to Corey Finley for not only showing us a vision of the future that we've never quite seen that is very sad but also there's a humanity to it. I, I don't want to give away too much about the film, but Adam's artistic aspirations get the attention of the aliens and he's offered a choice. And the choice is not unlike the choice that an independent filmmaker might be faced with when signing to make a big budget Hollywood movie. I, now, a lot of these, all of this stuff I'm telling you is all underneath the surface. None of it is like hitting you on the head like a hammer. It is so well done. But it basically, these aliens, by solving every problem, is basically turned Earth into a third world country. 
and it's sad. It's just the the, the level of purposelessness that that has affected everyone. You know, people who used to be brain surgeons are now Uber drivers. People that used to be attorneys are basically coffee baristas because those things aren't needed anymore because these aliens basically solved all of Earth's problems and have become entrepreneurs and they've invited Earthlings to be part of the larger galaxy of creatures. And what I really think is interesting is from a science fiction standpoint, it always really was thought was weird to me whenever Star Trek would go to a planet like, um, you know, you'd visit a planet in the Star Trek universe. The aliens just have like bridges and they all dress the same or they look the same. So the, the way you know your planet is is united is when everyone wears the same unitard, which is ridiculous. Their, their vision of aliens, they, they don't sound like us. They don't feel like us. They don't communicate like us. They don't even view the youth. They don't view the world like humans. And so they're fascinated by humans. I, I absolutely love this film. I was blown away by it. I saw it after Blue Beetle. When saw Blue Beetle then saw this and I would just I can't I can't stop thinking about this film. I plan to see it again. Strong recommendation. This movie is a nine out of ten for me. And it is what really good science fiction should do, which is comment on our present day in a meaningful way. And I just I just loved it. Love, love, love this film. Let's see if there are any comments from people or anyone else. I'll just, yeah, I'll just say, uh, yeah, I interviewed Corey Finley on the Film Thread interview channel. We talk a lot about this this book um, or the movie. I saw it back in Sundance, um, but I have to agree with you. And I think I agree with everything you said, but I think one of the highlights of this movie is Tiffany Haddish. Um, she gives an amazing performance. And I, I think... What makes it amazing is she really acts in this one. She's yeah. Uh, she gives a dramatic performance as the as the mother, and uh, and we talked about it. But by having her be normal throughout most of the film, when her when when the comedic moment happens for her character, uh, it just makes that moment uh, even more better. Um, yeah, no, this so, is in my opinion, this is the best thing she's ever done. Yeah, I mean, I mo mostly think of her as a comedic actress. She was really good. Tiffany Haddish was really good in uh, that Eric Andre movie. Uh, oh, the, it's the Eric Andre movie. I think it's on Netflix. It's one of those like, you know, playing jokes on people, mm -hmm. and and she's in that. She plays a, a an escaped convict. <laughs> awesome, but but uh, she's so good in this film. And the young actor who plays Adam, the artist, yeah, Shante uh, Black. Yes. Uh, okay. If they cast a Miles Morales, they should cast him. Yeah, absolutely. He's Asante Black. He is so good in this. He's so likable. And the whole idea of him being an artist, what I like is he's an artist that's at the beginning, the beginning of his journey. So his art is very good. You see like kind of where he's developing. And I love the opening of the film is this montage of his artwork from like being like a kid kind of dabbling, like not very good. And then they tell the story of, of getting to the present day, which is the movie set in the year 2036 through his artwork. You see, it's, oh my God, Corey Finley did such a good job. So you're seeing the story of his family and the story of Earth's contact with the aliens. And then you see on the news, they have this like monument that was defaced. Uh, it's the monument dedicated to first contact with the aliens. But it hasn't made, all of this technology hasn't made the Earth better. It hasn't made people happier. And you just see like, you know, you take away purpose from people you see what it costs you when you take when you when you basically have everything you basically have like enough to live and whatever and enough to get by that's not enough you have to have a higher purpose in life and i this movie is so it's such a great comment on um on you know our world today i, I just think i just think you you have to see it it's, yeah. it's, you, you may not love it as much as I did, but this movie will provoke conversation. It'll provoke conversation. Yeah. And, I mean, and last week we talked about the pod generation. Yes. Uh, it's just the fact that there are two good science fiction movies coming out back to back. Uh, you know, the, just this ability to 
I mean, these are modern day parables, essentially B yes. being able to take, uh, you know, what's happening in, in the world today and shine a light on it through, you know, kind of a back end light uh, through through science fiction. And the, again, the, another great science fiction movie coming out. This, uh, in yeah. Strong recommendation. See the interview with director Corey Finley on the Film Threat Interviews channel. We also interviewed him for his movie Thoroughbreds, uh, I think back in like 2018. Uh, we interviewed him, but cannot recommend this movie enough. And it's a movie that I love to see a small independent film, science fiction in nature that makes commentary. We'll go to your quick comments here. Then we're, we're going to discuss Ahsoka. Yay. Uh, here we go. Uh, Landscape with invisible hands is awesome. Says Mike MC Wong. Uh, Iceman says Vulv. It's yeah, like that's a, that's what that's the name of the, the aliens. The, the aliens vulv. is like the vulv, vulv. The oove, vulv. Yeah, not the oove, but vulv, vulv or something like that. Vulv. It's it's just you see their language, and it's like they're trying. There's like a funny scene. They really do the world building so well. There's a funny scene where they're trying to learn the language, and the language is them scratching their hands, and the scratches are mm -hmm. the language. So they scratch these slugs, scratch their hands. It's so yeah. awesome. By the way, the, the movie's based on the novel by M.T. Anderson, uh, Landscape of the Invisible Hand. And yeah. we do talk about, Corey does talk about the, you know, what you do when you option a property and how you have to get that thing done or you may lose it. Yeah. Uh, let, let's see. Uh, Davina Duckworth, is Invisible Hand a critique of comic communism? It's you know not I, just a critique. It's a critique yeah. of communism, uh, social media influencer culture. It's um, elites versus blue collar. It mm -hmm. it takes shot, but it does what great science science fiction should do. This movie asks questions. It doesn't tell you what to think, and but it does critique communism. Is it a TV movie? Says Nighthawk Nine. No, it's in theaters and it opened today. Uh, Soul Feud says, "I am sold, Chris. I will be seeing this film." Awesome. Davina Duckworth says invisible hand is a bit on the nose on economics term on economics terms for market e economics, says Adam Smith. Just just watch the film. Watch the film. Come to your own conclusion. But the movie is a critique of many things happening today. that You'll never you're not going to see in another movie. Geek True 64. This is why I like film thread. I find out about movies like landscape and pod generation that I might miss otherwise. That's why we exist. It is literally my mission. Yep. Sounds like an Outer Limits or Twilight Zone movie. And I dig those. I might check this out. Edge, Scarborough, check it out. Check out this movie. Can we expect Landscape with Invisible Hand Happy Meals? No, not going to happen. And a super chat here from Vanguard for 499 Okay, now I get how super chats work. One of these times I got to meet up with Chris, Frank, and Alan the only downside, L.A. area. Well, uh, AMC Burbank 16 is kind of our meetup point. Join us there. Yes, and I will be there when the Marvels comes out. That's a promise. <laughs> You'll have, yeah, if it comes out. Uh, Eight Hours 24, another indie film that is being buried by the theater monopoly in Canada. Well, look for it. It's also a lot of these movies, these small indie movies, they tend to come out on VOD a couple weeks after. So look on demand. Yeah. It's uh yeah, it's on I think vertical is involved. Maybe I'm thinking of some other movie. Never mind. No, plan B. Plan B, that's right. Plan B, yeah. But uh just be patient. You know, it'll come out on video on demand. But I am I plan to see this in a theater next week again because it is that good. It just and it does what it does what really good science fiction and really good independent films do. It makes you think about life, and it gives you so much. We couldn't stop talking about the movie. Uh, the sound of one man laughing. Will no one help Chris with his white balance? <laughs> Is something wrong with my? Who who cares what I look like? I don't care. You just care about my voice. By the way, next week I'm gonna have a whole new setup for audio, so I'm gonna sound better next week. Tuesday, on Tuesday, 9 a.m. Pacific time, 12 p.m. Eastern, we are going to review Ahsoka episodes one and two. So join us then. Yes. Let's pivot. Let's pivot. 
and a quick review of we're going to do a quick review of a movie real quick let's talk about a movie called the adults alan saw this i think it's sundance no at uh, oak cliff film festival yes alan tell us about the adults which stars michael sarah uh his two sisters and uh it's about it's it's about young adults transitioning from being irresponsible kids into adulthood Alan, tell us, tell us about the adults. Yes, be careful how you use the word transitioning. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Michael, Sarah, so this is a family. Michael Sarah plays Eric. Hannah Gross is Rachel. Sophia Lillis is Maggie. Um, their mother recently passed away, uh, and so they're kind of left with the house. The, the family is a little bit uh, devastated by that fact, and Eric has gone off to do his job, leaving behind his sisters. And one day, Eric decides to just show up uh, and... I think travel plans forced him to kind of hang out with his family. Um, and the movie is just about, uh, you know, a once close family uh, torn apart and then kind of trying to pick up the pieces and, and bring them back together. Um, you know, uh, Maggie is the youngest. She misses Eric desperately. Uh, uh, Rachel is... Uh, there's, there's a conflict between her and Eric that has kind of made them estranged. So much so that when, when Eric is in town, he'll stay at a motel. He won't stay with his sisters uh, in their in their house. And um, and uh, so this is, it, it kind of, so what happens is uh, Eric is a poker player and uh, he's found himself a nice home game. And uh, and he's, he's kind of like, uh, he he's doing really good. And keep, keeps wanting to play this poker game, and so that forces him to stay with his family longer. And uh, and as as the more time he spends with them, the more of the conflict that they refuse to talk about uh, builds up. So it's it's basically a family drama. Um, I uh, kind of admire what this was doing, but it, it, I'm I was not a hundred percent sold on on the movie. Um, the way it's shot is it's very improvised. Uh, and, uh, and the, yeah, it, so the dialogue, it just feels very labored at times. And, and sometimes you feel like they're just trying to fill in, fill in the gaps of, of, uh, of silence. Um, but the thing that really annoyed me about the movie is apparently this family were once theater nerds and, um, and the way they, the, what they did as children were, were to, what's to create. Uh, I don't know, the best way, like little variety shows, they would do song and dance numbers. Uh, they would uh, they would mimic uh, their favorite characters. There's a scene where where Maggie and Eric get out of a situation by imitating Marge Simpson. Um, you know, as as much as I know that I think they were trying to endear the audience with these things, uh, it got to be a bit annoying, um, and so. Yeah, I mean, I gave it, I gave it a bare recommendation just because I like the fi family dynamic, but uh, I don't know. I was not a, a huge fan of this movie. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I, I thought it was fine. I like. Uh, look, I'd rather see uh, a, just an okay indie movie than like a big Hollywood mm -hmm. blockbuster. Just, uh, but I, I, I really enjoyed this. I enjoyed the performances, and I like Michael Sarah. Look at Michael Sarah as Alan. Mm -hmm. Right. Michael Sarah's yes. Alan was the big highlight of Barbie. You know, you had Alan representation in, in, in the adults. So uh, I enjoyed the film. And uh, there's an interview actually with Michael Sarah and the director on our interviews channel. I think it dropped today. So mm -hmm. I actually quite enjoyed the film. Um, I, I like the sort of like I know like sometimes indie movies can have kind of a slow burn. It's more character based. But I actually enjoyed it. So yeah, it's it's kind of like it, it, it. It's fictional cinema verite. Yeah, you know, that, that's what they're going for. Just trying to be as authentic, and you know, it's so it 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 reeks of that indie vibe at that yeah. point. Uh, let's go to your comments and questions. So a, a mild recommendation for the adults. Let's go to your comments mm -hmm. and questions, and then we're going to get to Ahsoka. I promise with my social media reaction of the first two episodes. Soul Feud, do you think indie films are performing better these days due to the state of Hollywood? 
I think they're doing better because people are coming back to theaters and they may be burned out on Hollywood. My whole thing is this. If you lived on a diet of only fast food, you would feel sick and you would be disgusted and you would be sick of fast food. Uh, and I look on indie film as like food that's good for you. It's, it's like a good chicken with broccoli or a steak with asparagus. You got to balance out your Hollywood movies with your indie movies. Because if you only watch ho Hollywood films, you'll think that everything is garbage or these movies are always trying to like indoctrinate me with some BS or why does the, why do these dumb lame tropes always happen? That's not true of indie movies. So it's all about balance. And look, if you only watch indie movies, that's not great either. You'll get a skewed view of the world. I think it's balance. And part of our purpose at Film Thread is just to say, hey, we're going to talk about these big Hollywood movies, but these small indie movies, these are the ones, and we talk about mostly the better ones worth your time, because we talk about a lot of indie movies on the Film Threat website. Yeah. A lot. They're not, oh, just, because the movie, just because the movie's indie doesn't mean it's great, okay? Yeah. We'll call it, but we but the better ones bubble to the surface, and those are the ones that we talk about on the show. Yeah, but, I'll say this about the, the state of Hollywood and the strike. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's given independent films an opportunity to be seen at major movie chains. Yes. Because they are desperate for, for films to show and yes. they are turning to, to independent films. In fact, Regal has bought a few independent films to show exclusively at, at Regal theaters. So um, yeah, you know, there, there is hope for, for indie filmmakers to, to be seen and to get distributed in ways they never thought they could. Yeah. Uh, Sifax, uh, AJ says, yes, Burbank AM 16, good times with great people. If you're in the area, come join or at least say hi and go to Sushi Stop. <clears throat> sushi Stop during the week, Monday through Thursday. Uh, it's happy hour all day, dollar beers, $4 pitchers, and $1 sake, cold or hot. By the and, way, we uh, met a lot of you at Sushi Stop. Well, <laughs> we you and eat. I were at Sushi Stop. <laughs> yeah. I think we got the last time. What I think it was we, three times people would like love the channel. And, uh, I'm pretty sure we had sushi. They've got a really good uh, uh, green tea ice cream. Green tea ice cream. Yeah, that's it's called wasabi. No, it's not called wasabi. It's actual green tea ice cream. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, we're there every week. I'll say it again. Film threat, Chris and Alan. You guys in the chat have enlightened me on films and life. Also, quote of the day: Chris know how to scratch. Says Solomon Thornton. Yeah, I know how to scratch dogs. I know, I know the, I know the pressure points. I could be a dog masseuse. I could be a dog masseuse. That's how good I am. Uh, Greasy Guido. Someone's got to be clipping these. All right. Greasy Guido says, "Hey, I watched Gore's interview with Sarah and Dustin over on the Film Threat Interviews channel. Gore, right. I think you should throw a fun question into the mix of required standard questions. I get it. A lot of it is time. You know, like." Sometimes when I'm doing these interviews, there'll be like a person, the pre-records, there'll be a person that's like a publicist saying, wrap up, wrap up. And I can't, I mean, I did try at the top to kind of like, uh, and I like Michael Sarah. I'm not a Michael Sarah hater. Uh, like I, I've always liked him. Scott Pilgrim. Mm -hmm. Love Scott Pilgrim. That movie, I think it's good. And I you really mentioned it. it. The music. Yeah, I brought it up in the interview, but like sometimes we're under time constraints with these interviews. We're going to try and do better, but Greasy Guido, thank you for the feedback. I always try and include something fun. If you see when we do our interviews live, when we do the interviews live, we'll get like your feedback and we, we will have fun. So watch a bunch of them. Uh, and there you go. Thank you, Greasy Guido, uh, who's a member. All the more gooder for five you know what would be awkward? A blame it on Rio review by y'all after all of Chris's nooners with Alan's daughter. What are you talking about? What is what, what is that comment supposed to mean? I'm not sure what that. I think I think it's uh, like an October romance type thing. Oh, oh, oh. I yeah. see what you mean by that. Yeah. I see what you mean. Alan, daddy. I hope you're okay with uh, this guy, by the way. That last picture? I, I have no idea what that's a reference to. Really? No, and I, I don't know. even know. I don't know when that was shot. I think it was Dallas. Uh, 
Thank you, all the more gooder. Crazy cat, which is worse, an LA dog owner or an LA movie snob? Oh, LA dog owner, 100%. LA movie snob, I'm fine with. I know how to deal, you know, I know how to deal with them. But yeah, thank you for that. And Ninja Vanish says, Alan, why are you a Michael Sarah hater? Oh, I'm a Michael Sarah hater. I mean, I, you know, just because I, I didn't appreciate the style of the movie doesn't mean I hate him. Uh, right. And I feel bad because apparently Paul Dano is uh, taking all his Hollywood roles. So. Well, there you go. All right, we're going to pivot. Let's talk about another movie that before we get to Ahsoka, Trey, I promise, show might go a little longer today. So thank you for that. This is going to be very, very brief. Very brief, folks. Talk about something that I have a beef with Alan. I have beef with Alan. Let's go. Let's discuss this movie. Shortcomings. Playing <laughs> in limited release. Alan, tell us about Shortcomings. No, I, I will be honest. Uh, I saw Shortcomings at Sundance. And uh, so I, I, you're going to have to go through the, uh, the story plot here because uh, I don't remember the exact story. It's a story of a woman. Her name is, excuse me. It's a story of a guy named Ben who is in a relationship with a girl named Miko. They are a couple. He works at a movie theater, but he's an aspiring filmmaker writing a script. He's a huge movie snob, which is kind of like why I like Ben played by J Justin Min. And he has kind of a fetish. This He's an Asian man who has a fetish for white girls. We see where this is going. Uh, when Miko finds his stash of porn and all the porn is white girls, uh, she decides to take an internship working at a film production company in New York. They're using it as an opportunity to have a, a little break in their relationship. So Ben uses this as an opportunity to pursue some of the uh, young ladies that he's had a crush on. He's friends with a woman named Alice, played by Sherry Cola, who was uh, recently in Joyride. Uh, and her, she is, Alice is gay. Uh, she's also Asian. And she she likes white girls as well. What can you say? Uh, ben and Alice have a lot in common. It's the type of indie film, like it reminds me of like High Fidelity because it's about relationships. And it, it lays them out very bare. The idea of Ben being a filmmaker is just sort of a jumping off point. This is this movie is also directed by Randall Park. And if you're someone who loves movies, if you're someone who's thought about making a movie, or you're someone who's ever attended like an indie movie theater, like a Landmark, a Lemle, or a Frida Cinema in Santa Ana, California, this movie is for you. It's for movie nerds. It's about pursuing your dreams. It's about the costs of relationships when you're trying to pursue those dreams. And what I loved about this film most is Ben, Ben's character played by Justin Min, is an unapologetic asshole. I love that aspect of him. Uh, it reminds me of, you know, one of the things about the old Seinfeld show is like a sitcom, but they don't learn any lessons. And Ben is just an asshole. He's a film snob. He's he kind of knows what he wants, but he's kind of a jerk about it. And uh, I, I don't know. I just found him very endearing, maybe a bit too relatable to me. So there you go. I tend to like I like likable assholes. <laughs> maybe 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 I'm describing myself. Yeah, maybe so, maybe now I understand why you like this movie. You're uh, right. <laughs> right, right. OK, but wait, wait, wait. Let me defend. Let me defend. I just really enjoyed it. It's like solid, like feels like an old, you know what it felt like? It felt like an indie movie you would see in the nineties. That's what it felt like in a good way. It's just simple about relationships. It doesn't hammer. There's no like woke messaging, whatever it is. Like there is some stuff that's cultural that I think is really funny. Like Alice convinces Ben to pretend to be um, her boyfriend to the family. And they're like racist against, cause they're like, Korean and they think he's Japanese. Anyways, there's like a whole like cultural thing about different types of Asians that hate each other. What? That's a whole rabbit hole that you could go down. And I love that. I, I, I love that aspect. So I really enjoyed shortcomings. I recommend it. Give it like a solid seven if I have to rate it. 
Um, but it reminds me of like the kind of 90s indie movies that I really love with like really good music. It's just simple story of people, really good side characters. There's even a joke about the actor um, who plays Ned in the Spider-Man homecoming movies, Spider-Man No Way Home, Homecoming. The actor who plays Ned, who's Filipino, he's in this movie. And they make a joke about, you know, Spider-Man in it. It's funny. Yeah. They make a joke about Marvel movies. So the movies, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not like, you know, it, it, it's just fun. It's just a quick joke. But I just, I enjoyed this film quite a bit. Alan, your thoughts on Shortcoming? Yeah, I did not walk away feeling as excited as you were. Um, I mean, look, if you if you strip the story down, it's a guy who uh, whose girlfriend dumps him. She travels halfway across the country to to pursue her, you no, know, to go get on with her life, and then the guy chases after her and tries to tries to get back into her life. I mean, that's right. essentially what the movie is. And I'm like, I've seen this. Okay, great. Uh, look, Asians in it. Great, I love it. But you've never um, but seen that, the, but you've <laughs> never seen that story with. Wait, you've never seen that story with Asians. Alan, this is for yeah, you. There you go. I mean, look. Come on. Yeah. I mean, you would think I would love that, but I'm like, you know, eh. I think part of it is is like I, I think what I walked away with feeling was uh was was uh Ben was such a jerk that I really didn't care about. You know, it's like, of course a jerk would do this. And and he did it. And there was there was your story. I mean, it was like I you know, you 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 want to go to a movie and feel like, you know, that you've seen something elevated or you, you know, you see something that's basically not your life and, uh, and you know, you're presented your life on stage. It's like, if, if my life was so interesting to make a movie, this is that movie. <laughs> and, uh, um, and then, which is why they don't make movies about my life. So I, uh, you know, I, I, pre I, I love the fact that you loved it. Um, I, I love the comments are saying you have an Asian fetish. And, uh, what? And uh, you know, I, I just I, I wanted I wanted something just to walk away with and say, uh, you know, you need to see this. And I, I just can't. I just I've, I've just seen this story too many times in movies. All right, your quick comments, uh, but shortcomings strong recommend for me. Not so much for uh, yeah for, for, for Alan over there. Wait <laughs> over there. So there you go. Um, here we go. Short what? Says uh, uh, at 69. Yeah, short, short what, Chris? <laughs> says Robert Shaw, Paul <laughs> Champagne. Um, Go-Go Go Party Time says it's based on a great graphic novel of the same name by Adrian Tomac Yeah, I, how, is, how, how is this a graphic no, novel? No, it felt like a graphic novel. It felt like... Um, it, it felt I don't know like like um eight ball. You ever read eight ball by Dan Klaus? No, no. You ever but again, it would be stuff? like me reading a graphic those. novel about my these, life. Okay, these are not these are graphic novels that are like not superhero stuff. Yeah, like Yummy yeah. for Chester no, I Brown. Did. Anyone know I, I, that? Yeah, it's old school stuff. Or like Love and Rockets. Did you ever read Love and Rockets? No, no, I read the superhero ones. Yeah. Thank you for that go-go party time. It felt like it had that Dan Klaus graphic novel, like, you know, sort of the world, you know, just like, uh, I, I, I don't know, just I, I, I enjoyed the film. Alan is fighting, smiling so hard right now, says Turo. From Rumble, Aid Ellis, Aid Ellis 24, big week for Randall Park, starring voices, voicing in strays and directing shortcomings. Doc Savage says, at what point in the film did Alan begin thinking, the fuck is this shit? <laughs> and Wes Ray, short crunchings. And uh, Glenn Lintz says, is Alan saying this hits too close to home? No, no, it just hits close to home. It, it's like, it's like if you followed me around with a camera and made a movie, it's like, how, how exciting would that be? I think it'd be exciting. Uh, for five, Mr. Burger, I'd be honored if you could check out my animated cartoon sitcom, Mr. Burger. Your insight means a lot to me. Uh, drop it in the chat or go to contact. Send it to us. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Burger. Yeah. If it's really short, contact. here's a quick word of advice if you're going to send me an email. Don't send me a wall of text. 
I always look at an email or a text and I go, what's the action? What am I, what do you want? What am I supposed to do? Literally, you could send me one sentence. Hey, I'm Mr. Berger. I talked to you on the stream today. Here's a link to my video. That's it. But I'll get these, what people want to tell me their whole life story. What, what do you, what do you, what do you want? I'm Ryan Gosling. And then what do you want? Just tell me what you want. So there you go. Just keep, if you, if you ever communicate with me, you know. Just tell me what you want. Yeah. Yeah. Just cut to the chase. It's simple. Check out my animated cartoon. Yeah. I'm computer, going to now. And then link. <laughs> yeah. Send link. Marco. Uh, yeah. Marco CC S6. And no pictures of dogs. Yes, I know. When you see like the feed of someone and it's just their pictures of their dog, that's an unfollow. That's an unfollow. I'm sorry. <laughs> Director Mink, how about the subject line? Subject lines can be long. I don't give a shit. You could put the question in the subject line. Yeah. Even better. Uh, let's see. A winter su a soldier sub supporter. I don't know. I watched Alan paint that room and nothing gets more exciting <laughs> than watching paint. Exactly. Room. And. Exactly. Uh, and uh, Chris is the supreme LA hipster movie snob, says Crazy Cat. I'm not a movie snob. I, I'm sort of about certain things. Like, I like weird indie films, but I like big mainstream Hollywood movies just as much. So there you go. All right. The time has come. Alan, do we have the Ahsoka? Uh, of course not. Thing in there? Here, let me just. No, I don't even have a photo. All right. Let's get this going, Alan. Let's get it going. Oh, wait. I was looking for this one video that I wanted to show. Um, uh, where is it? Alan, where, Alan, where is it? Alan, 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 Al, Alan. Okay. Is it all set? What are you telling me? We need the background for Ahsoka. Uh, it was, it was in the to... planning sheet. It's all it's all good, man. Yeah, just all just good. do it. That's all right. I'm gonna look at. What do you mean, just do it? Just uh, do we really need a photo? That's not... Yeah. It's gonna take a while. Here we go. How is it gonna take a while? Because uh, it depends on what format you. All you right, look. Like. Damn. We have we have over 800 people watching now. Please subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed. Hit the bell for notifications and like this video. Next week, we will be doing a full review of Ahsoka on Tuesday, August 22nd at 9 a.m. Pacific time, noon Eastern time. Join us then. For right now, I'm going to give you my social media reaction to Ahsoka episode one and two. Ahsoka is a return to form for Star Wars. It feels very Star Wars. And if you are a fan of Star Wars Rebels and you are very familiar with all aspects of the story and you know all of the characters from Star Wars Rebels and you know all of the events and you know how Star Wars Rebels ends, then this is for you. But I never watched Star Wars Rebels. So I've been completely confused watching I, watching the first two episodes. I was completely confused. Um, my basic reaction to it is they are, are, it's a return to form for old school Star Wars storytelling, which is your, your wipes that match the movies, your action and adventure. And it, it, it's um, there's just something about it that is off, and I'm not exactly sure what that is. I think part of the thing that's off is there's a severe lack of male characters in this, or at least even like likable male characters. Um, Ray Stevenson as the big bad is is very good, but my overall takeaway is this is the beginning of she wars. 
So, and this is less about Ahsoka and it's more of an ensemble setting up Grand Admiral Thrawn. Like, now you could, you could glean this from everything you've seen in the trailers, but there's something about this that feels that I can't, my overall social media reaction is that if you're a fan of Star Wars Rebels, you'll love this. If you have not watched Star Wars Rebels, you'll be confused as to what's going on. And I don't believe that Dave Filoni did a very good job of catching you up to what you needed to know in order to understand the events happening in this. There are some paragraphs that open at the beginning of this, not the crawl. There's not an opening crawl, but there's paragraphs in red lettering that kind of tell you the basics of what's happening. And it still doesn't do a very good job of setting it up. There's a character named Ezra who is missing and everyone's very sad about Ezra, except we don't really hear what happened to Ezra or what his sacrifice was. I guess I need to have seen Star Wars Rebels. I would have hoped that those of us that don't watch the cartoons, because I, I will say I, I I did watch at least the parts of the first season of Star Wars Rebels, and I thought it was for kids, which is why I didn't continue to watch it. And I happen to know that there's a very big fan base for Star Wars Rebels. So may, perhaps this show isn't for me. Uh, I think our trial kind of said it all. And... Um, while there are aspects of this that feel very Star Wars, there are so many things that took me out of it. I'm only going to give two examples. We will go into detail. I promise you. We will go into detail next Tuesday. We'll go into detail on it with a full review. Um, but there are certain details in this version of the Star Wars universe that began to bother me. A couple of things. One, the universe is way too clean. Two, all of the costumes seem like seem like they were designed by her universe. Everything is too clean in this version of the Star Wars universe. Didn't feel like it was lived in. Additionally, and this is a weird thing to notice, one of the characters named Sabine, you see her with some equipment and they do close-ups on her hands. When did fingernail polish like become a thing in the Star Wars universe and a heavy use of makeup? I mean, Princess Leia had makeup, but it didn't seem heavy. Same thing even with Rey in the Star Wars sequels, right? Yeah. She Princess had, Leia didn't have underwear. So. And she didn't even have underwear. She didn't have a bra on in the first movie of Star Wars. Um, so this, it just seemed a little off. In addition, there's also another scene with Sabine where she's riding, you know, a speeder bike and they play a punk rock song that has like these lyrics that are probably lyrics, but, but it is a total like punk rock to show what a rocker she is. Sabine is a Mandalorian who's aspires to be a Jedi trained by Ahsoka. There's a mystery and all of this has to do with the return of Grand Admiral Thrawn. So my social media reaction is that um, this is, this is uh, if you like Disney Star Wars, you'll like this. If you like Star Wars Rebels, you'll like this. And if you didn't, you probably will not like this. I am going to withhold uh, any sort of further comment until Alan has also seen it. And I'll, I'm going to watch it again and we'll talk about it on Tuesday. Let's go to your comments and questions. So are we talking uh, Kenobi production values or Andor production? Values? I think this is better than Kenobi in terms of production value. How about it's Andor? Still, it's it's um, different than Andor. Okay. But more like the Mandalorian then. That, that more like the Mandalorian. You okay. know, good production value. But uh, different. Mm -hmm. Ahsoka could be summed up in a, into a subject line, says Sarah Payne. Yes. A full review of Ahsoka, or er, I don't care. <laughs> His thoughts on fitness with Nigel, member for eight months. Well, I hear you. I Hollywood, hear on you. The Rocks, Hollywood on the Rocks is going to be on Tuesday next week instead of Wednesday. We will not be doing our normal Wednesday show. It's going to feel weird, but we're just going to do our Wednesday show on Tuesday rather than do Tuesday morning, show. by the way. Tuesday or morning at 9 a.m. So look for us. Uh, 
Alan Horkin's The Star Wars Rebels was based on rejected concept art for Star Wars, and it shows. Yeah, everything in this world feels a little off. It just feels... So that makes, Alan, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's just like there's this robot, this sort of rusty, fanciful, cute robot that looks like Bob or Vincent from the Black Hole that mm -hmm. uh, didn't really work for me. Um, Turo says, Alan, is your TV behind you with the screensaver stuck on that other movie? Or is it speed to be aligned with the current topic? It just rotates through all yeah, the movies yeah. we're, we're reviewing today. Yeah. There's in Landscape Invisible Hand right there. Brock Samsonite, wish you had seen Rebels so I can ask you about how Thrawn is portrayed, Chris. Thrawn is not in the first two episodes. But there is something that happens at the end of episode one that basically made me think, fuck this show. <laughs> fuck this show. It happens at the very end of episode one, and then episode two kicks off, and the stupid thing that I just saw is completely... Duh! I'm saving it. Uh, yeah, this is not a review. <laughs> this is not a review. This is not, not a, a review. review. Uh, Thrawn isn't in the first two episodes. I have this weird suspicion Thrawn will not be in the show until maybe the very end because they're dragging all this stuff out. But it feels very Star Wars from the opening scene. I, the thing is, is at least I get the feeling Dave Filoni is trying. He's trying. But the mandate is just put women in this. And there's a real effort to like go, hello, female in power general. Hello, other female also in power. Let's be formal with each other and and discuss our, oh yeah, they're going to be some rants next week. Yeah. Mob 19001. Oh, you're going to get probably more than a few rants next week. I hear that and, Acolyte will have neither men or women in it. So Yeah, even better. Horror Punk says nobody wants a female Disney version of Heir to the Empire. Nobody. I don't mind. Look, I like strong female characters in my fiction. Love it. But when all the characters that are men are bad, and there's one in particular, and uh, I'm just saving it. I'm holding back, folks. Yeah. There are just there are like three key moments where I'm like, "Fuck this show, fuck this show." Three key moments. I'll go over. I'm gonna do three separate gore rants. You're gonna hear a new thing. Yeah. And well, I, I, have, I, have, the, I huh? signed my NDA, so I have access to the episodes now. But we we'll talk about it on. Um, We'll talk about it on Tuesday. So there you go. Uh, will it necessitate another trial? No, not not even worth it. Not worth it. So, Gore review. F this show. That's my. That's um. That's basically where we're going to leave it. Uh, so there you go, folks. So I'm going to save it for Tuesday. My apologies, but please tune in Tuesday at 9 a.m. Uh, and we're going to wrap it up there. I want to thank our mods, Lord Thoth, all the all the mods. I have to thank them. Yes. And sir. say thank you to all of them. Thank you to our mods, Lord Thoth, Latino Slant, oh, Ms. Yeah. Pete Coffee, Glenn Brown, our intrepid producer. Just want to thank you all. And, and I want to thank our viewers for tuning in and watching us every Friday and Wednesday. It's uh it's our honor to be able to bring you sort of different forms of entertainment every, you know, every week. Alan, what do you have like coming up? Anything big coming up this weekend? Well, uh, I will be at Holly shorts on Saturday night. What are you doing? Why uh, am I not Sunday. meeting you there? Are you going to be there? I can be there. Well, I mean, I'm going to be, I, I promised the publicist I would be there. So I'm going the last day of Holly shorts. All right, all right. But um was well, so though you go so Alan's gonna be at Holly Shorts at the TCL yeah, uh, theater the in, in Hollywood. Uh what is it theater? It's the Chinese theater. So it's oh, at, there you go. Right. There you Were go. you looking for a clippable moment there? Yeah, yeah. So this is your this is your quick from Leo Cody, a quick video <laughs> Thank you.
yeah, live streams every week, uh, Wednesday. Except next week, it'll be except on Except for Tuesday. next week. So I shouldn't have even shown that video. That was a mistake. Uh, anyways, thank you to you all. Appreciate you. We will see you next Tuesday. Uh, Alan, what do you got to say for yourself? Let's get out of here. Take care, everyone.